Hello everyone. Welcome to the Easy Power Thursday webinar series. I'm your host today, Jim Chastain with Easy Power. We wanted to welcome everyone uh, attending across the, the country and in some cases across other countries. Before we introduce our guest speakers for today, as we are in the habit of doing, we'd like to run a couple poll questions and would very much appreciate your uh, participation and feedback. There's no obligation or liability, but it will help our uh, presenters, or our speakers, have a context for which the topic is uh, focused. So if you would please respond in kind based upon uh, your experience, that is, how many, over time, how many projects that you've done have included relays. So this is mostly an average and it's, as I say, there's no liability and no downside. It does give us a good perspective on the audience interest and uh, level of knowledge. So it looks like we have a quorum here. We'll leave this open another five seconds. So here's how people have responded. Good. So our second question is, what is your, who is your go-to source for relays currently? Again, this is not to pry, it's just to kind of get a general feel for the audience's knowledge of the marketplace. Clearly, uh, what we're in, have in line is a, a detailed background on li relay operation and the evolution of the technology. And so there are several people in the field that are competent sources. And certainly this is to expand knowledge of the overall product line, not just lean it necessarily towards one vendor. Okay, looks like we got a quorum here. Good. That reflects at least my expectations. And then third, and this is one question I was really curious about is how often do your projects involve electromechanical relays? And this is more history. And I, we're getting some good responses. So we do appreciate your participation and your attendance today. Looks like we have pretty much a quorum here. Thank you for joining in. Yourself folks have weighed in there. And surprises me a little bit. It's probably reflective of my lack of knowledge. Well, good. So at this point, I'd like to uh, introduce our uh, guest speakers, Andrew Legro and Nikita Mishra. And uh, give me a couple seconds to share the screen. And Andrew, you have the podium. Hello, everybody. Um... This um, this seminar is on uh, protective relay basics, um, and it's kind of just as the title title says, um, kind of a really high level survey of uh, of protective relay. Um, my name's Andrew Legro. I'm I'm a field application engineer for um, ABB, uh, and I work out of Florida, and my my territory is. Uh, is Florida, and um, my job is is uh, basically to work with consultants and uh, contractors and owners on um, applying ABB products uh, and assisting them with power system design issues and things like that. So it's a it's a really fun job. Um, I'm kind of a I'm kind of a jack of all trades because I I represent and you know I provide uh, assistance for the whole product line of. Uh, of the ABB cells for electrification in um, in the U.S. and that includes General Electric. Um, I I, st I came from the General Electric side when ABB acquired us in um, about uh, 2018, so about three years ago. So um, I got a got a pretty pretty busy job, and it's it's a lot of fun. Our our guest speaker or our, our, our my host speaker um, is Nikita, and she's here to um, make sure I don't say anything dumb. Uh, she's the product expert on on protective relaying, um, specifically numerical relaying, the um, 
the real fancy stuff, the current day stuff. Um, I'm an old guy, so I, I I'm a generalist, and I go back to the days of uh, electromechanical relay. So um, she's here to she's here to back me up. And Nikita, did you want to introduce yourself? Thank you, Andrew. For sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Nikita Mishra. I'm a product specialist for the Western region uh, for digital substation products at ADB. Um, it mainly revolves around Reliant uh, product line. And I have previous experience of designing low voltage and medium voltage switch gear. And I'm glad to be here. Welcome to the presation. Thanks, Nikita. I, I, I'll try to kick it off with just a little background. Um, like I said, I'm with the, with the field applications team. We're about, uh, we're about 60 strong, and we came from both the General Electric and ABB side. Um, we're broken up into regions, so each FAE is in a region um, that is physically located there as well as that's this job territory. Um, so if anybody wants, please reach out to us and we can put you in contact with um, with your local your local uh, FAE. And um, th this team is for the U.S. and Canada, so any Canadian um, participants, you know, same, we're pretty much the same group. Um, I'm not sure. I, I don't really know outside the U.S. Um, how we how ABB does it, but um, you know, feel free to reach out to me. You'll have our contact information, email, um, if you need to get in touch with your uh, your local FAE. Um, for those, I was kind of interested in in those poll results because um, I was surprised because it seems like we're going to have a lot more um, relay competent people on here than I was expecting. Maybe even probably even more knowledgeable than me. Um, the objective I had for this was more towards my consultants tend to be low voltage consultants that get involved in relays on especially coordination on an infrequent basis, and they need you know they, they need a lot of support from me, um, and a lot of it has to do with just the basic concepts because the um, the fundamentals are the same, but all the all the, the verbiage and the technology or, and the uh, terminology, it's, it's just so foreign to uh, uh, people that deal in low voltage breakers and systems all day long. Um, but I thought this was kind of a nice idea to try to expand out um, at, at least enough knowledge to, uh, to be able to be comfortable having conversations and, and uh, integrate some, uh, some medium voltage relaying into your, you know, into your low voltage systems. Um, so I'm surprised that there seems to be a lot of experience on the on the call. So I kind of apologize; it's, it's a very high level, but I, I still think that you may be able to find it a um, interesting discussion. Just a little back on ABB slash General Electric. Um, it, we they acquired us in 2018, so we're we're basically the combination of um, of ABB and General Electric, and um, in terms of the protective relays. Also, Westinghouse, because ABB had acquired Westinghouse back in um, uh, 1989, I believe. So when they did, they, they got the transmission distribution part of Westinghouse. So they got basically the, the utility segment and then also the protective relaying segment. So all the old classic Westinghouse relays, like the COs, which I'll be talking about, we own them. Um, and we still manufacture them, uh, mostly for replacement. You know, it's not a lot of it's in new construction, but um, that's still a relay that we we support from a, 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 an engineering perspective. Um, so our, our history, you know, our, our group, the combined ABB, Westinghouse, and now even the GE, we don't we don't have the GE line of relays. GE Multilin is, is was left behind with the GE Power Grids business. So they're a separate company, um, and you know they have their own they have their own expertise going back 100 years, and we have some of that because we brought some of those guys along um, along with the acquisition. So uh, the point I'm trying to get across is that ABB, from a prote protective protective relays perspective, goes back all the way to the turn of the century and the, the beginning of uh, the beginning of uh, electrification. So I, I, after the acquisition of, of, of Westinghouse, ABB uh, take, basically took the electromechanical relay and then moved it into the, the, the 20th, 21st century um, with uh, first electronic and then 
then straight into uh, multifunction numerical protective relaying. Um, so it was a, a rocket ride from from where they started. But so we've been around as a you know, as a company for a long time, even though you may not may not know our name in uh, in North America so well. Like I said, the the objective is to try to do a, a really high level survey of protective relaying. And I kind of said it's you know it's geared a little bit towards the low voltage guy that's familiar with using easy power for coordination studies and um, but in for low voltage breakers, but maybe has to get involved in some relay projects. Um, the the fundamentals I'm going to talk to uh, are going to use electromechanical relays kind of as a baseline because if you're familiar with it, all these terms like the names of different curves and um, the concepts of uh, like tap and time dial, they all come, go back to the electromechanical relay, but they've been essentially brought forward into the world of the numerical relay, the electronic, you know, microprocessor-based multifunction techno box. And if you're only, if you're a younger person and you just, you know, you started to experience and learn about relays from say about I don't know, 20 years ago, uh, a lot of that, the terms don't make any sense. And they, they don't, because they don't really have a direct analog into the, the numerical relay. So that's kind of the, the basis. I'm going to try to get just the basics of it and then sort of relate them back to um, what the equivalent term would be for the, for the low voltage world, um, the world of trip units and, you know, molded case breakers. Um, and that brings me, I guess, a good kind of a good segue into um, the the relay versus the the low voltage breaker. So basically, relays are pretty much exclusively used on medium and high voltage equipment. Um, and there's always some exceptions. And uh, a general note is, I'll be making a, a lot of statements in this that some of you experts out there will be upset about or disagree with, or and that, and that's fine because um, it's a uh, the whole topic is kind of an art and a science, so you know, everyone's coming from their own different perspective and training, and uh, so there may be some controversial things I say, uh, and it's my opinion only, not ABBs. But um, feel free to shoot me emails if you wanna if you wanna discuss things I say, or you think I'm, you know, you think that something I said was wrong or or whatnot. But um, so the the relay versus circuit breaker, relay medium voltage. Uh, Circuit break, the molded case circuit breaker and low voltage circuit breaker uh, for under 600 volt applications. Um, the big difference is that the the relay is a, a one component in a, a larger engineered system, whereas the low voltage breaker is a, a all in one solution, basically pre engineered. Um, it's uh, I don't like to say plug and play because there's still a lot of engineering that goes into it. But it's a, a solution that you, you, you pick up your breaker, and then all its ratings and everything are pretty much predefined, uh, and all the parts you need are included in the package that you buy. Whereas a relay is just it provides only only the smarts for the system. It, it's only the protective functions, and maybe some logic for control, maybe metering. Um, but it's not the circuit breaker, and it's not even the sensors. And the circuit breakers and, and the, the sensor and the breaker mechanism and the low voltage breaker all come together as one big big package. Um, so the relay requires uh, sensors, which is typically current transformers, um, control power. That's that's a big another important thing. Um, they're not self powered. You need to have some sort of reliable power source, battery, or uh, or UPS, in order just to have the protection system work at all. And then the circuit breaker itself. Um, historically, they started out as uh, uh, sort of clockwork devices using um, uh, induction disks and electromagnetic uh, electromagnets. Um, but now, obviously, they've developed into these full-blown uh, supercomputers in a box. So a lot of a lot of evolution, and and most of that evolution took place only in the last, I would say, twenty-five years. Um, I, I did. I, I had some information from FPNL looking fully down here, and they basically said that they were they were fully electromechanical until the mid 1990s. Um, now they've almost made a complete transition, but the the big push didn't come until 
very, very end of the 20th century. So um, it went from 100 year tech, old technology to state of the art in a, in a very short period of time. Um, the, the relay, a relaying system requires a bunch of engineering, obviously, because you have multiple components and they all have to be, uh, they all have to work together as a system. And that's the responsibility of the specifying engineer and design engineer to make sure that his relay and his CTs and his breaker are all working together as a system and to know what the totality of those components can do performance wise. Whereas the, the low voltage breaker, it's gonna be printed in a data sheet exactly what that breaker, what that breaker can do um, in terms of uh, its curve. Uh, the curve includes all the, uh, the trip and total clear times, and so that's it's a, it's a package versus a versus a system. Here's real basic stuff: uh, the difference in in symbology between describing a medium voltage system and, and a low voltage uh, system slash circuit breaker. The medium the voltage, the standard ANSI stuff, is um, uh, sort of this box symbol um, for the for the breaker uh, versus the this air circuit breaker symbols conventionally used for low voltage uh, molded case stuff um, and molded case and, and power circuit breakers. Uh, the CT is the symbol here and then the um, the relay but there's a there's a, there's a unique utilization of these ANSI device codes for uh, for the for relay for medium voltage stuff that don't necessarily convert over to or are used in the low voltage. So in other words, you, you would define these two numbers, 50, 51, are uh, instantaneous and time over current protection as defined in the standard. Um, the device 52 is the actual circuit breaker itself. This 205 is just the ratio of a CT. And then the equivalent for a low voltage circuit breaker is uh, its trip characteristics. In this case, it's electronic so it's LSI long short instantaneous and then um, it's a uh, sensor and frame uh, ratio 200 amp trip or 200 amp sensor plug and then 600 amp frame um, the LSI would roughly equal the LS would be the uh, the 50 I'm sorry the, the LS would be the 51 device and the um, I or instantaneous would be the would be the 50. So 50 is instantaneous. 51 is uh, time over current. Yeah, this is a, actually this is actually an important slide because um, this goes through one of the kind of big things I'm trying to uh, uh, convey on this this presentation is this terminology. Like for a protective relay, uh, it's set. The settings are called like tap, uh, time dial. Um, they use the term range, curve type inverseness inverseness of a curve um ct ratio uh equivalently in, in the low voltage world you'd have things called like pickup delay long time short time instantaneous uh ground um the cts in a, in a breaker like this are called sensors uh so completely different vocabulary but both describing exactly the same physical uh phenomenon and basic kind of components, but completely different vocabulary. Um, here's just a, a kind of a breakdown of the um, the device numbers, the ANSI IEEE standard device uh, numbers. And these are not only valid for the uh, circuit breaker, switchgear world, but also the um, also control. So if you're designing a um, motor control center, uh, you know, schematic, uh, you would use the same same device numbers, um, so they're sort of universally used in the power slash power control uh, realm of engineering. The um, here's a very abbreviated list. The total list is this IEEE standard, and we have our own. I know ABB has a couple really nice printouts of uh, descriptions of all the device numbers and and what they do. If uh, shoot me an email, I can send you a copy of that. And the device numbers basically go from one to 99. So this is just a very, very shortened list of kind of the high points of, of um, if you're a, a casual uh, user of relays, what you got to know. And really the big ones are 
uh, device 52, which is the actual circuit breaker, device 51, which is your uh, time delayed overcurrent, and then your device 50, which is your instantaneous overcurrent. And then I'll, I'll get to the next slide. It can be broken down even further into um, whether it's uh, instantaneous for a phase, instantaneous for a neutral, 51's time, so this would be a, a time overcurrent for a neutral, time overcurrent for a ground, and then you have some non, uh, the rest of these are sort of non overcurrent uh, protected type functions, over voltage, uh, 81's frequency, 86 is a pretty important one, it's a lockout, uh, 87 differential protection, so in my opinion about 90% of the time uh, the devices you're going to see are, are kind of in this list. So then there's um there's some common suffixes that are used on those devices um and it's uh like p for phase so you'd have a 51 time over current with a p means the um the phase uh n for neutral g for ground uh b for um bus there's a typo here i should say 87 b as in boy t for transformer that's 87 t uh transformer differential BF would be break or failure, and usually, if you're if when you when we get into the numerical relays, these um these are going to be important because each element in the numerical relay will say that it's a it's a 51p or a, a 51n, and that terminology even shows up within Easy Power itself when you select a uh, a specific relay, you know it might be a um uh abb uh, ref 615 and the the actual library is for the neutral uh protection so it'd be a 51n so they're kind of these are kind of the important ones to to know fundamental the, the basic parts we kind of already discussed are um the relay itself this is a example of a abb numerical relay current transformer and um circuit breaker so you need at least these three pieces to make a complete circuit breaker system and uh this this circuit breaker this would be this is a vacuum breaker uh used for um for medium voltage uh switch gear but it could be a whole a whole slew of different kind of breaker technologies and sizes and configurations but it's just kind of like a this more of a medium voltage switch metal clad switch gear example even the current transformer people with a sharp bio realize that this guy here is a really it's a 600 volt class CT, but it's used in medium. It's used in 15 kV switch gear because it goes around insulating uh, bushings. So this is this is the actual uh, class of CT that we would use in, in our medium voltage uh, switch gear lineups. Here's a slide just kind of showing um, the physical device in relationship to uh, some of the symbols used. So these two these two circles that show a um, instantaneous time over current and then a time over current ground all these elements are part of this single box plus a whole slew of, of additional stuff ct here's the actual ct ratio would be this one 600 to 5 the, the 5 on the secondary is a typical secondary for it's, it, it's it was historically a default standard secondary ct current in north america so every CT was something to five in North America. Now, if you go into the European market, they had a lot more of the X to one ratio. So they used one as a secondary current versus five in the uh, in North America. And the five goes back again to the fact that they were electromechanical relays, which which drew physical load off the CT. So the standardizing on five amp gave them a little more. Uh, power capacity so they could drive uh, uh, they could drive the, the actual elements that make up the relay that's just a little background and this last number is a, a accuracy class for the CT and then here's your circuit breaker same same stuff this is all this is all pretty much medium voltage uh, gear and then then here's your components that make up one breaker and then they all go into a, in some cases a bigger assembly so this is all those components brought into um, a, a really short lineup of uh, medium voltage metal clad gear and this is a double stack so this is actually four breakers uh, two on top two on the bottom 
and then um, all your instrumentation is in the center section. So you see, you got a relay that might be for the top. This one might be for the bottom. Um, trip and close handle for the breaker. Uh, same thing over here. Just one relay. So one of these might actually be an empty cell. I'm not sure, but basically, it's saying that these these components all pop into one of these one of these cells, and then they make up a bigger bigger system like a like switchgear. The CT, the, the CT is a big, big part of, of designing a, uh, uh, a protective relaying system because it, it really sets, uh, it sets the, the uh, size of the circuit you're going to protect. Um, in, in the medium voltage world, the first circuit breaker frames, there's not as much variation. So you may have a, 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 a 600 amp, 1200 amp, 3000 amp frame, and that's it. So you set your uh, you set the current for the specific circuit you're trying to protect based on that CT ratio. Let's see here. We talked about this. The typical secondary is a five amp. The primary side is the one that's connected to the to the actual cable or circuit. The secondary side is connected to the relay. This is interesting. This interesting point. That multiple relays can be can use the same CT. So you can have one CT drive. Uh, a couple of different protective relays plus a meter. The limit is defined by how much physical load that CT can drive, and then that is that is relative to the accuracy class of the CT, and that gets a little complicated. But um, the larger that that uh, class is, and it's usually like a C something, like C100 or C200 or C50, that C accuracy class basically is equivalent to how much electrical load the CT can drive and remain out of, remain accurate, remain out of saturation. So um, and it's sort of like terminal voltage. So if you have a, uh, if you have a C100, well, I think I have an example here, let's see. So your accuracy class, going back to that point of how much it can drive, uh, say you had a C, um, and most of them are usually classified as C. That's a that's a uh, uh, I, I can get into that, but the um, the terminal voltage uh, part of it. So if it's a C100, it can drive 100 volts of load at, uh, at without saturating. So you can you can basically because it's CT normally it's, it's CT is shorted, you know obviously, but then uh, whatever load it's driving through its short. Uh, Whatever voltage develops there, that would be this number. And, and this is not, it's not an exact correct explanation of what I'm saying, but um, it, it, it's sort of indicative. So basically, the, uh, uh, the higher the number, the higher the C class, the more load, the more load in terms of protective relays that CT can, can drive. So I know that was a little bit contrived, but uh, let's see if I can clean up a little bit. Yeah, the uh, back to the ratio, the uh, the the first part of the ratio, like for example, the 600 here, um, means that the 600 amps of line current will produce a uh, five amp secondary current uh, in the CT. Now, oh, here's an interesting note: the uh, uh, there's there's two basic classes of, of current transformers. One's for metering, so there's a metering class, and then there's a relaying class. Um, don't use metering class relays for, or I'm sorry, metering metering class CTs for uh, for protective uh, relay applications. They, they they they're not designed for that. They're designed to be accurate, but they're not that exi designed to have a large range on them. Uh, so when you do a relay application, you're going to select a relay class CT. Now you can, in the inverse of that, you can take a relaying class C can be used for metering, but you may have some reduction in accuracy. So kind of the bottom line, and I'm, I'm gonna move off the CTs as fast as I can because this gets too, gets too deep. But for, um, for from a protection engineer standpoint, the, the most important things to know about the CT are the ratio and the accuracy class. I'm gonna try to go through some of this quickly. Here's a table of some standard uh, CT ratios. Um, these are for multi-tap CTs, so you can get a you can get a CT that you can reconfigure its ratio based on what taps and jumpers you put on it. So you can get a 605 MR, which would be multi-ratio, 
and that can be set to drive either a 50 amp load or a 600 amp load, and, they, and all these variations in between. Here's some stuff about uh, circuit breakers. Um, the big takeaway is that the circuit breaker has no inherent protection on it. it, it it's just it's just a uh, switching device capable of, of interrupting short circuits and 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 operating also as a switch. Uh, but it's got no it, no brain in it. Um, uh, basically, mostly no sensors because usually the um, usually the CTs are uh, in the this is a draw out breaker, so the CTs are part of the the switch gear or the assembly it goes into. So it, it's just it's just the breaker itself, as opposed to uh, low voltage equipment where the breaker's a a uh, one piece does it all plug and play. For what the if you're a protection engineer, the basics you need to know are um, the frame size and this pretty typical frame size is uh, 600 to 3,000 for 15 class 15 kb class gear. That's it. So if you needed a 100 amp breaker, uh, you know for 100 amp, 100 amp application, you would the smallest you can get is a 600. Uh, and actually in medium voltage gear, uh, we bought them out of 1200. So if it's a, if it's a 100 or a 200 amp breaker, you're in a 1200 amp frame. Um, and all the all the the actual where a trip set is set by the CT and the relay. The interrupting values are good to know. Um, now they're all done in KA, just like low voltage. It used to be a different system, but it's changed over the years and got a little bit simpler. Um, typically, they interrupt in either three or five cycle. Now it, it was historically fifth, five cycle was pretty common, um, but now. I think that the three cycle breaker is a little bit more common and, and pretty readily available. And this is important because this determines how fast uh, you have to add this time onto the time it takes for the relay to pick up. And we'll kind of get into that. And then you should also know what the, uh, what the actual trip coil voltage of the breaker is. And note that the trip coil voltage doesn't have to be the same voltage as the uh, any other control on the circuit breaker, like the spring charging mechanism. Um, for example, uh, you tend to want to do your trip coils at uh, DC. So you might have a, a, a 48 volt DC trip coil, but then the rest of the system that charges the spring charging motor and it does your control and contacts, some of that might be 120 volt AC. So you can have you can easily have mixed voltages in a in a uh, circuit breaker. It's just something you need to be aware of. Now we're finally getting to the we're finally getting to the overcurrent relays. Um, basically, I'm I'm just going to go through. There's many types of relays, do all kind of uh, different protection functions, but I'm keeping it really simple. It's just a uh, just an overcurrent uh, device, and so this would be your uh, your 50, 51, 50 being instantaneous, and 51 being your time overcurrent. Here's an example of again the same multifunction relay, but in the next couple of slides, I'm going to start out with the uh, electromechanical and then kind of move my way up into uh, into numerical, like, you know, multifunction. This here is your overcurrent relay, um, electromechanical type. This is a ABB CO9. This, this, this goes back for a long, many, many years ago. Um, it was probably in production for maybe 80 years, this thing. The, 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 uh, this started out as a Westinghouse product, and then when ABB acquired it, it's now it's ABB. But so you might see you might see some old equipment in there with a uh, the Westinghouse nameplate or the ABB nameplate. It's the same it's the same relay. Um, we we own it, and you know contact us for information uh, that you need on it. The electromechanical mechanical relays are they're kind of clockwork like devices, and they tended to be in the medium voltage world because they were they were more accurate and it was more things you could do with them in terms of protection as opposed to stuff that was in utilization equipment at low voltage so uh the electromechanicals used um induction discs and uh uh solenoids and things like that to uh achieve the protective function whereas the um circuit breaker uh at low voltage used uh thermal heaters um or just thermal elements plus some magnetic stuff but um that was sort of the origins of it now that's all changed and current day um there's no real 
in my mind, there's no real difference in the accuracy you can get between a uh, low voltage circuit breaker with an electronic trip unit and a, a high end uh, relay. So they're they kind of started out in two different directions for two different applications, but now they're very much overlapped in what what you can do with them. But this last point's kind of good. I, I know there's a lot of these that still are in service, so I sort of expect that you know some of you are going to get applications where you're going to put you know some a new system on where you're going to utilize um, multifunction relays, but you got somewhere you got to coordinate it with an old induction disk. Um, so hopefully this will kind of this will kind of help you out because these are these have been around for a long time and they're not, they're not going anywhere. Here's just kind of a, a comparison and form factor. These two relays are about the same dimensions. This might be a little bit bigger, but um, you can see there was a lot of intentional uh, design on this to make it mimic this relay because one of the interesting features is the internals of this relay are draw out. You can open this box, pull out this relay. So it can be tested. Same thing here. This is a handle that pops out. So the back part stays within the gear, but you can draw this relay out, test it on a bench, or even just swap it out if you know if you had a problem with it. Um, so it's the, the 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 this is this is just a follow through on the original concept because um, it worked. This was a good this was a good design. It worked well, and um, it was it was copied over and, and brought forward into the uh, the new technology, but this relay here can do overcurrent 5150 on a single phase. That's it. So on a on a normal three phase breaker, you'd have one of these for each phase, A, B, and C. This guy, all three phases plus almost any other thing you're gonna ask it to do. So a panel that might have had uh, four or sometimes even like six or nine of these devices on it for one breaker. Has now been reduced to a single single box. Here's a nice slide just showing you. This is this is the internal component. This is the actual relay itself that's drawn. It's been drawn out of the box. This is kind of a bad picture, but uh, you can see um, this is a, a overcurrent relay with. Uh, and I'll get into some more of the details. But this is the internal of, of that. The relay. I'll get to this real quick. But basically, the overcurrent relay uses an induction disk to time itself for the uh, time overcurrent portion of the protection. And there's uh, there's two basic settings for an induction disk time overcurrent. There's the time dial, which sets the delay, and there's the tap, which sets the uh, the pickup. That's it. Now you get into your multifunction relays and things start to get really complicated, but if you go back to the basics, two settings, time dial, tap. So just this sort of a, a a quick tutorial on how to read these things. They look complicated, and um, it, if you walk up to it, it's it's very unclear as to what they're set to, what they do. Uh, so I just want to do a, a really quick thing on how to how to look at an old electromechanical relay and and see what the settings are. For the overcurrent uh, time overcurrent, there's a tap and a time dial. The tap is literally a tap. It's little holes with a screw element that you can change from all these predetermined tap values and that will set the pickup of the relay. And the time dial is literally just a little dial and no notches, no detents. It's a continuous dial that goes from like, say, uh, uh, 0.5 to 11 and you, you spin it until it meets uh, the setting. That's it. This relay, the CO, also has instantaneous or uh, 50 uh, protection on it too. And that's kind of just a separate element contained in the relay right here. Um, and its settings are really simple too. You have a range tap, which is the same as the other tap. It's a screw that screws into a, whatever hole you pick. And then there's a, a pickup adjustment dial. That's all there is to it. And then this piece here would be a flag that drops if it, if it picked up on that. But um, the point I'm getting across is that for an electromechanical overcurrent relay, you had um, uh, 51 tap, 51 time dial, um, and then 50 pickup with maybe a range. Sometimes there weren't even ranges on them, depending on the model. Um, this is the last piece. This is just a, uh, and this is extra uh, contact, but I noted it because it uh, it also contains a trip flag. So the relay 
actually has two trip flags, one for the instant one for the time over current element, which is here, and then one for the instantaneous. So in this picture here, you can see that it, this breaker had tripped on, or this relay had tripped on a, a time over current. Uh, here's an example of kind of what I was talking about before, where you know you have uh, you have multiple um, multiple relays required for uh, the protection of a single a single circuit breaker. Um, this was this was pretty typical. This is old GE gear. Uh, I think power brake. So these are probably GE relays too. Um, circa 1980, probably. Um, but you can see that here's kind of a three line diagram. You can see this one breaker, and this is the, the pretty much the most basic overcurrent protection you can put on it. Had a um, three relays for phase overcurrent and one relay for ground overcurrent. So four relays in total with all the associated wiring uh, just for one breaker. Here's some explanations on on the on the settings of the uh, of the relay. Um, we have uh, it's back to what I was talking about: uh, tap, time dial, and then uh, curve. So your uh, your this is for time over current. So for your time over current, you have your time dial, which essentially moves the curve up and down in in time on the time axis, and then your tap, which essentially moves the uh, moves the uh, the pickup left and right on your ampere axis. Your 51, or your, I'm sorry, your 50 uh, is then this part of the curve down here, and that typically only has a uh, pickup value. It may have a range, the set plus the pickup value, but as you're you have increasing pickup, that moves the, uh, the this part of the curve to the uh, left or the right in terms of amps. And all this stuff carries forward in, into the numerical relay. So, uh, and what with all the same same terminology, one of the one of the advances that that the that almost all I think numerical relays have now is they have this added piece that you can add to a, a typical overcurrent, which is sort of a time delayed element. It's sort of a time delayed instantaneous. Some people call it a 50 TD, but it allows you to have a a true instantaneous plus a delayed instantaneous and then a time over current which is inverse time um and these uh these set with pickup and uh and then a uh pickup or tap and then uh delay um and this this lets you mimic some of the features that you would see in like a um uh, electronic low voltage breaker where you have a a short time element i'm sorry a long time element a short time element and then instantaneous Here's the curve family that's pretty typical for relays. There were all these model numbers dependent upon which manufacturer you had. Uh, ABB at slash Westinghouse had they, they called them CO and then gave them a, gave them a number at the end. Uh, GE was uh, IAC with a number, but then they had these terms called like extremely inverse, very inverse, inverse, moderately inverse. The the terms are sort of what the curve is but they're not consistent across manufacturers. Now there's some standardized versions of it. So there's an ANSI standard uh, inverse and extremely inverse, but there's also the CO inverse and the IAC inverse, and those are different. Um, and probably in, in modern days, you really only have to worry about uh, CO11 through CO8, extremely inverse through inverse. The rest of them, except for definite time, the long and the short and moderately are, are kind of legacy uh, legacy curves, but you can see that as that uh, as that curve uh, type changes, it, its response changes. So you can see that like a CO11 is uh, uh, its its inverseness, so to speak, gives it more of a I squared T response, and then a um, uh, very inverse. Is a they're a little a little bit less than an I squared T and more of a thermal overload uh, type response. So these are usually the the basic selections you have for curves when you're doing the the uh, protective uh, coordination study. Here's an explanation of the, the last important one is which is definite time, and it used to be that definite time it wasn't really de definite time means that it it if the relay picks up. It times to a certain certain preset number, and then it trips. Um, the historical stuff, 
and some stuff that's still around there today is not exactly it's more this red curve than it would be the on off so um just be wary of that and so this the definite time is used for um things like uh that 51 time delay um a lot of functions that are not involved with current like uh over voltage um it's basically hit a pickup value wait a certain amount of time preset time and then trip or not trip here's an example of of the time dial adjustment and this is basically to show this is one this is a co9 this is a very inverse curve and here are the different time dial settings and it's really meant to illustrate that it's, it's not in relays, it's not a true up and down change in time. It's more of a slope to the uh, to the left and right. So as you increase the time dial, the slope is actually moving up, but it's also moving a little bit to the right in terms of amps. So the curve, the way the curve looks, kind of changes, and that's a little bit different than the way low voltage breakers with electronic trips work. I'll try to wrap it up here. Um, the importance of this one's kind of important so I'll, I'll i'll go through it the the relay um and the curves that get represented in, in easy power and every you know standardized it's just the response to the relay but it doesn't include what the breaker is doing so this blue line is the relay um and then i drew in this light blue hatched area would be the additional time that you need to be wary of to allow for the breaker to uh pick up trip and clear and that that ranges it, it, and this this also includes some of the accuracy of the um the ct plus uh artifacts of the relay itself like uh electromechanicals had an over travel where they sort of spin down so all those factors had to get added into the relay curve response so that you knew where you could set your next breaker so your next breaker couldn't be anywhere except uh, above here or else you wouldn't be fully coordinated so in other words you couldn't you couldn't just draw the next breakers curve right down this area intersecting this hatch because uh you would you would run the possibility of tripping both of them at the same time they wouldn't be coordinated and here's a couple really really rough recommended intervals if you're looking at a um electric electromechanical relay if you if you didn't have detailed information a safe number to use in terms of uh, uh, time to uh, 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 interval time between devices, it was about 0.4 seconds. For a uh, for a numerical relay, you can cut that at least in half to 0.2, and and most of the times you can go much lower than that to uh, probably no more than um, uh, I'm sorry, no less than than 0.1 second or six cycles. That's probably cutting it to the to the bone. But you can get more, you can get tighter coordination as long as you put the work in of doing the engineering analysis because there's a lot, there's a lot to it. So that, that, that's one of the big things that is different between doing relay coordination versus uh, low voltage breaker coordination. This kind of further example, here's, here's a downstream relay and an upstream relay. Um, and uh, I'm just kind of show electromechanical. And I'm just showing you that that's that's that minimum value you got to set where your upstream relay is away from your lower uh, relay, and that's all due to the um, the speed of the breaker and the accuracy of the CTs and uh, a whole myriad of of design issues. Since we're running out of time, I'm going to speed through some of that stuff and just get down to some some basic uh, basic recommendations um, for. Uh, Electromechanical relays, um, I think I've been through this. The the various manufacturers all had different curves with the same name. So there may have been like a, a CO9 very inverse from ABB. It wasn't the same curve as a, what GE called a very inverse, uh, which would have been an IAC 53. So the, the, the take home is if you're in an electromechanical world, avoid mixing different manufacturers and models. Um, because they're not, it can be done, but it makes it makes your life more difficult because they're not they're not the same type curves. Most of you probably won't get into that situation anymore because you're not you're not specking new electromechanical relays. For uh, multifunction numerical relays, doesn't matter because most all relays have a whole selection of uh, different curves you can pick. So they'll have ANSI standard curves and IC standard curves. 
Uh, the only thing to remember is whatever you're picking, do the same thing. So if, you, if you're going to do ANSI, um, make sure all your curves uh, that you use in various relays are all ANSI um, and you're, you're good to go. Um, and I would choose I would I, I, I would choose ANSI standard curves for uh, applications in North America. There's an IEC version of those curves too, which is different. So if you're in outside the U.S., Europe, I think uh, the Asia too um, would tend towards using IEC type curves. Yeah, this is kind of important. It, it, it usually you try to keep the the, the type of curve, whether it's uh, extremely inverse or very inverse you try to keep it the same on all your devices um but you can do as long as your upstream stuff is um is less inverse you're okay so for an example a um a, a very inverse relay upstream will coordinate just fine with an extremely inverse relay downstream but the opposite's not true so an extremely inverse relay that's downstream will conflict with a uh, very inverse relay that's upstream. So uh, rule of thumb is to try to keep them all the same curve type when applicable and possible. And if not, always have your, your less inverse curve upstream. Here's a couple little tips on uh, coordinating with um, different types of fuses. If it's an expulsion fuse, um, you usually want to use a delayed instantaneous. If it's a uh, current limiting fuse, you can use a full instantaneous. You can use full instantaneous protection, no delay, and uh, rule of thumbs about you set that to about 110 percent of the uh, the current limiting value of the fuse. That gives you enough clearance time. Here, I'm I'm promise you I'm getting to the end here. Here's just some I printed out some examples of uh, in Easy Power how to set the relay. So you have your uh, each device. You have your manufacturer. Um, here's your type. This one's multifunction, so you can add in uh, as many functions as you want to have turned on in a relay. Um, so this one's really basic. It's got a, a, a instantaneous and time over current phase. Same for the neutral, and then a time over current for the ground. And then here's the details on the, so you got, you, know, you have basically kind of four devices in one. And then under the settings tab, this is for device number one, is your 5051P, that's, that's why it's called it. Uh, so you can call it whatever you want. Then you have your um, your uh, 51 protection. This is the um, this is the range, and then which is this one for this case is preset. And then you have your setting, um, and that's that's the uh, that's the tap value. Um, and here's your time dial. This is where you pick the curve. Now when you, you select this in for this specific relay, you're going to get a whole list of curves. So I just selected the ANSI extremely inverse on this this relay. Time dial setting, range. This is for your instantaneous protection. This is for this 50 here is for your time delayed version of it because you have a time delay plus a tap setting. And then this 50 here is for your instantaneous. So you actually have a essentially what is a, a long time, short time, and then a true instantaneous setting all on this relay. And then here, just real quick, these are examples of um, modern, uh, our, our current day relays, and the, uh, the, the circles in kind of just give you a feeling of the number of protected devices you can get all in one box. Like this is, this is a really basic uh, numerical relay, and you got your uh, 50, 51, all three phases, plus you have, um, oh, ground current, um, neutral, uh, this AFD is additional functions for arc flash detection. So you have basically all these devices built into one box. And then here's a, just a slightly more advanced relay with a, both a current and voltage input, but still a basic feeder relay for, for uh, feeder protection. And you got a whole slew of more stuff you can do, like under voltage, over voltage, uh, directional power flow, um, directional overcurrent, uh, frequency, just tons and tons of things that you can do. With a with a single box, and then here, lastly, uh, I think it's the last slide. This is an example. I, I pulled up one of the ranges of our relays in terms of what curves you can select. So you got this. You got a whole slew of stuff. You got all your ANSI from uh, extremely inverse down to um, definite time. I don't even know what ITE inverse. I, I honestly I can't tell you what some of this stuff is. 
then your IEC curves, which is the European standard, um, and the same thing, you got all your inverse type uh, things. Programmable, you can actually go in and program, program uh, basically your own curve um, in the relay. So it, it's got it's got essentially infinite flexibility on developing the kind of curve that you need for your specific protection. So I know it went a little long, but um, I appreciate your I appreciate your time. If we can got a couple more minutes, I can do questions, or I can I can take them offline. Andrew, you want me to read some questions to you? Yeah, if if, if you're if we're good with time, I'm fine. We got a couple minutes. So, what's the difference between a Type C and a Type T in the CT discussion? Ah, the 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 um the, the Type C has its uh does not require to be tested. It can be on a um it, it its curve has been its curve is by design and produced. And you can you can get the actual uh, uh, production curves for it. Uh, the T, T means needs T T means tested. So that so it, it's it's saturation curve is done by test. All right. Is there a benefit or preference for having the CT before the breaker or after the breaker for relays? Yeah, there is. It's it's for zone and protection. Uh, if it's if it's a main, you'd want it on the line side. If it's a if it's a feeder, you want it on the load side because that that way your zone of protection extends past a little past the breaker. Right. And then the last question: Are MV breakers typically one hundred percent rated? Yes, the ratings are completely different than than low voltage. But yeah, they are generally they're one hundred percent rated, um, with the caveat that for your your particular application in terms of you know temperatures and whatnot, you may want to go in to look at that to make sure that you're within that rating. It looks like our time is up. I'm sorry we didn't hear from Nikita, <laughs> but I appreciate the presentation. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we'll have a copy, a PDF copy of the slides available when the uh, video is posted to the website. Thank you very much. Have a good day. So long. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jim. Sure.